Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at vafarmbureau.org. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful local products we enjoy. Farmers have just wrapped up planting a major row crop in Virginia in the fall. Sweet potato season is upon us. What does it take to grow these delicious tubers yourself? And a historic park has added a historic pig breed to showcase how colonists ate and survived in Virginia. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you from historic Westover Plantation on the James River in Charles City County. And that's where the winter wheat crop has just been planted. And it's our feature story this week. Drive through the Virginia countryside and you'll see corn and soybeans almost everywhere each summer and fall. But most Virginia wheat growers plant their crops in the fall when all the other crops are being harvested. Our winter wheats are generally planted October, October, November, and they actually go dormant during the winter months and don't really start growing again until March, February and March. It's, uh, it's a very long uh, growing season. Financially, you have income in June when we harvest that you wouldn't have with soybeans and corn. You'd have to wait till September, October, November to, to start getting. So it, it spreads out our financial risk also. It's a profitable crop to grow in, in southeast Virginia. So why not grow it? Dave Black has been growing winter wheat since he took over the family farming operation at age 22. It's always been his favorite crop to grow, in part because it doesn't require constant attention like summer crops. It is a long growing period. Uh, there are periods when nothing absolutely is being done. Uh, um, you mentioned snow on it. We actually like to see snow on it because here on the river, you have a lot of Canadian geese. Canadian geese like wheat. And if there's snow on the ground, they don't graze at all. Uh, they, can, uh, they can actually damage some wheat pretty heavy. While not as large a grain crop as corn or soybeans, wheat is important to Virginia farmers. It's a $114 million part of the state's farm economy, and the Old Dominion ranks 25th in the nation in raising wheat, almost all of it over the winter. Black says it's an important part of his crop rotation schedule on the hundreds of acres that he manages both to spread his financial risk and to better protect the environment. We will plant corn uh, in certain fields one year and we will follow that with wheat and then the wheat will be harvested and then we'll put double crop soybeans in it. I, I want some type of cover on the ground at all times. I do not want to be able to see bare dirt in February. Uh, by doing this, we are, uh, we are reducing runoff, uh, basically, uh, it has completely reduced our runoff problems uh, with uh, soil movement, and we're, wheat is part of that. Black uses a no-till planter in all his grain operations. The equipment basically drills the seed into the ground, usually into what's left of the previous crop's residue, to prevent erosion. We have a 180 bushel tank to hold the seed on this particular planter. It is fed down through a metering system, and then air, generated by a very large fan on the back of the grain drill here, moves it through the individual tubes up to a dividing device that moves it into these small tubes that brings it down, inserts it in between these disc blades, and the disc blades place it into the ground. For farmers like Dave Black, winter wheat is a win-win crop. All he needs is the right amount of moisture over the winter months, and the seed and soil will do the rest. It fits our rotation, it's financially rewarding to us, and it's good for the environment. Winter wheat is one of several small grain crops raised in Virginia during the winter months. Barley, oats, and rye are also raised during this long, non-traditional growing season. 
None of these crops rank among the top 10 Virginia farm commodities, but they are profitable for most grain farmers and offer a chance to rotate different crops on their fields. Barley's raised on 594 Virginia farms, and almost 3 million bushels of barley are harvested each year. Oats are raised on 144 farms, about 239,000 bushels are produced. And growers raise 158 bushels of rye on 120 Virginia farms each year. Hi, today we're going to be talking about sweet potatoes from the ground up. Please stay tuned. I love being a dairy farmer because it's an adventure to be a dairy farmer. It's a new beginning every day. Every day I can get up in the morning and have a smile on my face, whether it's raining or whether it's sunshine. I love what I do. Growing up on a dairy farm, I think you learn to work really hard and don't take anything for granted. There's a lot of work to do on a dairy farm. You have to be committed. It's a huge responsibility that we have being farmers. We take pride in it and we're proud to be able to do it. Every day we have the opportunity to provide a wholesome product that's vitamin rich and nutrient full. It's a feel good feeling knowing that I'm putting food on somebody else's table and that I'm doing a good job doing it. I'm Ken Smith. I'm Ben Smith. And I'm, I'm dedicated, dedicated to dairy, dairy my, my cows, cows, my, my milk, milk, my land. One of my favorite treats this time of the year is sweet potato pie. Chris Mullins tells us that it's easy to raise sweet potatoes in your own garden for pie or anything else from the ground up. Oh, well, hi, today we're at Virginia State University's Randolph Farm and we're gonna be talking about sweet potatoes. We grow a lot of sweet potatoes here. We do variety trials and different things, trying to work with commercial growers and with gardeners. And speaking of you, gardeners, I think this can be a crop that that would be a good one for you. And sometimes you don't think about putting that out in the garden. It does take up a lot of space and sometimes people stay away for, for that reason. As you can see here in this little patch, uh, it's nothing but sweet potato vines. They've uh, grown over and they've covered over, but hey, that's a lot less weeding for you to think about. So that's a good thing. Sweet potatoes are actually pretty easy to grow. Uh, you buy the slips, you put them in the ground. Um, you probably space sweet potatoes out uh, each row about three feet apart, and within the row, you want to space them anywhere from a foot to a foot and a half, maybe two feet apart. Like I said, and like you can see, they really vine out. So if you can uh, keep the weeds out for the first few weeks, they're going to cover up and you're not going to have any weed problems. Sweet potatoes are one that really don't have a lot of insect or disease problems. Occasionally deer want to munch on them, and that can happen to you, but uh, they might give up after a while, and they grow so fast that it's really not going to do too much damage to them. Now sweet potatoes are a, a tropical plant, and so they do require really warm temperatures. So in most of Virginia, we're going to want to put those out uh, probably in June, middle to late June. And you've got to uh, expect a long growing season for these, uh, at least 90 days, and some varieties are more like uh, 110, 115 days. So expect a long growing season, probably harvesting in October sometime. Um, some good varieties for the home gardener are ones like Beauregard, Covington, Puerto Rico, O. Henry, those might be some worth trying and they can get uh, nice size that you can use for pies and you can just have them to eat also for baking potatoes. Uh, overall, really nice plant to grow. Now as we think about harvesting, let's look at some that we're getting ready to pull out of the ground. So we've moved to a different part of the farm to, to show harvesting because this is a field that's uh, a variety trial and it's, it's ready to harvest. These uh, these plants have been clipped to get a lot of the excess foliage around so we can harvest easier. And you can do that in your garden just by clipping off uh, the foliage right, you know, a day or two before you're going to harvest. And one thing that you'll notice here, this soil at this farm is, is a sandy loam. And sweet potatoes do very well in this type of soil or sandy soil. And not so much in clay soil, but you can add compost and organic matter to your clay soil and hopefully amend it so that it will be better for sweet potatoes. And if you ever went to try uh, sweet potatoes in a raised bed, that can be a nice uh, situation. Uh, those raised beds probably need to be about 12 inches deep, uh, and you can make them out of wood and uh, fill them with topsoil and compost. Uh, you can also grow in containers like a bushel basket. Uh, maybe put one sweet potato slip in a bushel basket and you can uh, get potatoes out of there. Well, what we're here talking about is, is how to harvest. And so as it's coming into the time before for, uh, the first frost of the year, you want to harvest these uh, and get them out of the ground because they can be damaged by frost. And what we'll do is just take something like this, a shovel or a, a fork, and dig right into the, into the ground. 
and kind of on each side, keep about 18 inches away from the, uh, the plant. Kind of gently lift that up so that uh, we start to see some, some sweet potatoes come up. And then kind of clear away a little bit. You start to see some small ones, some a little bit larger ones here. This particular variety has got a little bit of red to it. There we go. There's one nice sweet potato right out of there. So the sweet potato, after you get it out of the ground, you want to brush it off a little bit. And you've got to be real careful too when you're digging these. They can scar very easily because they're very delicate at this point. And you really want to cure these sweet potatoes. You want to get them into a, uh, an environment that's high in humidity, around 80 or 90 percent humidity, and that's fairly warm, around 85 or 90 degrees. And you want to keep it in there for about a week, seven to ten days. At that point, the sugars start to mature and you get some scabbing over and protective skin, and then they're ready to eat. Well, for more information or for more detailed information about sweet potato production, please contact your local county extension office and talk to your master gardener. They'll give you a hand on that. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins, and we'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. Sweet potato meals are popular in many different cultures. Caressa Jackson shows us a different take on this special ingredient next in the heart of the home. Dazzling lights on winter nights will put you in the mood for the holiday season. It's the Illuminate Light Show at Meadow Event Park, November 21st to January 2nd in Caroline County. This spectacular holiday lighting event takes travelers through a musical show of color, lights, and design. Giant animated displays and illuminated trees lead to Santa's Village, where families can visit Santa Claus and enjoy the sights and magic of Christmas. To learn more, go to IlluminateLightShow.com. While not a major crop in Virginia, sweet potatoes are popular products at farmers markets and some grocery stores. They are grown commercially on only 120 Virginia farms, according to the Census of Agriculture. North Carolina, Mississippi, and Louisiana are the top sweet potato states in the nation. But the U.S. grows only about 1% of the world's sweet potato production. The USDA says China accounts for 81% of the world's sweet potato crop. And despite a similar appearance, sweet potatoes and yams are not the same product. In fact, they come from entirely different plant families. Sweet potatoes have been a popular dish for centuries, in fact, ever since the Spanish colonized Central America. Former Miss America Caressa Jackson has a recipe for them with a Hispanic twist in the heart of the home, courtesy of our friends at Relay Foods. Hi, I'm Caressa Jackson for Heart of the Home, cooking at the Meadow Kitchen at the Meadow Event Park. Today, we're gonna to be making shredded sweet potatoes with chorizo. So first, we're gonna start with one skillet. We're gonna use about a half a tablespoon of olive oil just to prevent sticking. And we have our heat up to medium. Don't want it too high. And then we are going to add first our one pound of chorizo. Gonna allow this to heat up. Then it's gonna start making a crackling sound. We're gonna cook this for about three minutes and then we'll add our shredded sweet potatoes. We got all of the foods for these recipes from our friends at Relay Foods. We're so thankful to have them as a partner. We want this to cook for about three or four minutes before we add our sweet potato. And we're about to that point now where the meat is bubbling. You can tell the consistency is changing. And we're gonna go ahead and add our sweet potatoes. We have two shredded sweet potatoes. You can also use spiralized sweet potatoes as well. We want to stir constantly to prevent our sweet potatoes from sticking. And if at any point you feel like they're sticking, you can add a little bit more olive oil or you can add butter. I'm going to mix this up. And we're gonna cook this for an additional three or four minutes as well. All right, 
right, so we have our chorizo and our sweet potatoes simmering on low. And we're gonna go ahead and start making our brown butter sauce. So we're going to start with 1 fourth cup of butter. And we're gonna just let this melt down until it starts to bubble. Sometimes you'll notice that the butter will get a little bit of a foam and we want it to start browning. All right, our butter is just finished melting and we wanna keep it on heat. You're gonna see it start to bubble. And once it starts to bubble and create a foam, eventually it's gonna brown just a little more. Want to keep careful watch on our chorizo and sweet potatoes. So as we are watching our butter, we want to keep stirring this as well to make sure that nothing is sticking to the pan. And then we want to stir in about two tablespoons of fresh sage. and one eighth tablespoon of nutmeg. I'm gonna reduce the heat to all the way off. Then we're gonna take our butter sauce and pour it on top of our chorizo and sweet potatoes. And then we wanna add in about four cups of fresh spinach. And one cup of scallions and we're gonna increase our heat back to medium so that our spinach will start to cook down. Now we have our spinach evenly distributed through the pan and it is finally finished cooking and we are ready to serve. So we're gonna go ahead and plate this in a bowl. Smells so good. And there you have it, shredded sweet potatoes with chorizo. I'm Caressa Jackson with Heart of the Home. Come and get it. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Relay Foods website at RelayFoods.com. Visit the Virginia farm that produced an American legend. See the birthplace of 1973 Triple Crown Champion Secretariat, now a Virginia historic landmark, at Meadow Event Park. Our hoof prints of history tours are given year-round by reservation. It's a perfect day trip for families, groups, large or small, and anyone who loves horses and history. Resident author historian Leanne Meadows Layden conducts the tours and shares behind the scenes stories about Meadow Stable and its most famous son, Secretariat. Meadow Event Park also hosts the annual Secretariat birthday celebration at the Virginia Horse Festival each spring. The festivities at the State Fair of Virginia and Meadow Event Park include an annual salute to Secretariat during both weekends. Come see where the legend lives on. Visit Secretariat's birthplace at Meadow Event Park. For centuries, celebrating Thanksgiving has been about much more than shopping and football games. In early America, it was about giving thanks for a good harvest. Dave Miller reports you can make your own trip back to Colonial Virginia and see how farmers fed their families. Good day. Welcome to Henricus. Henricus Park along the James River in Chesterfield County offers visitors a chance to take a step back in history. This 32-acre living history site now includes authentic colonial period livestock. Founded more than 400 years ago in 1611, Henricus is the second oldest successful English settlement in North America. Cordelia here is an example of a pig that the colonists would have raised here 400 years ago. Uh, she is a breed that today is currently um, considered in danger. Um, uh, there's not that many left in the United States. Um, and we are very fortunate to have her here to kind of show uh, children and visitors um, what, uh, first of all, a farm animal looks like, uh, but secondly, what one would have looked like 400 years ago. Um, so as you can see, she is uh, 
pretty long um, and pretty lean. Um, she's not what you would think of when you think of a, a cartoon pig nice and fat. Um, she definitely uh, has a lot of meat to her. She's probably about 280 pounds right now, um, <laughs> but she'll grow up to be almost 600 pounds. Cordelia is a female Tamworth pig. She's a vibrant red color and very intelligent. And Rowan says she's able to find her way out of all but the best pig-proof fences. The Tamworth breed is a descendant of the Irish grazers. They can live in very harsh conditions, yet are very people-friendly. Farmers from the Chesterfield County Farm Bureau felt it was important to have an authentic, historic animal for the exhibit. Henricus was the first commercial uh, agricultural site in the New World. Uh, the crop here was not a pigs, but the crop here was tobacco. And uh, we had uh, to tobacco and there was maize, corn, and squash and those types of things that were raised here. Cordelia is not alone among the period animals here at Henricus. The park is making a deliberate move from contemporary animal breeds to so-called heritage breeds. Many of these animal breeds are considered endangered species since they're no longer considered productive farm animals. For instance, the nearby neighboring goats are from a milking breed used by colonists for both milk and meat. The chicken coop, which was raided last year by raccoons, has a small flock of dorking chickens kept mainly for meat and eggs. The livestock here at Henricus helps educate the tens of thousands of school-aged children that may never have seen livestock before and are learning firsthand about how animals helped the young colony survive. This is how the colonists would have raised them. They would have turned them loose on the countryside um, and allowed this sleek body style, uh, the tall style of the pig, allowed them to graze through the woods um, and allowed them to feed on things such as uh, the undergrowth, the underbrush, um, worms, bugs living under the soil. Um, so she's helping clear the land. Um, she's cultivating it by digging it up. Um, she's fertilizing it by using the bathroom as she goes along. Um, and it's also providing a free food source uh, for her so I don't have to spend my time growing a crop to fatten the pig up. I'm allowed, or I can turn them loose and let them feed off the countryside. There are also many early 1600 style buildings at Henricus, including a large church and a blacksmith shop. Historic interpreters can be seen throughout the park in period dress doing colonial activities. You may even find some Native American descendants in the Indian village, which is designed to portray the original culture of the region. Um, our word for corn is actually pocahira, is what the Algonquin people call corn, and um, we call squash macaque and we call beans, um, we don't really know what they call the beans, but we know they're growing them. So we have a word. We only have 350 Algonquin words, so it makes it difficult. Henricus was the second place that members of the original Jamestown Company settled in Virginia and the site of the first hospital in the New World. In addition to disease and crop failures, much of the settlement was destroyed in the Indian Massacre of 1622. Today, visitors to Henricus can be sure to see authentic colonial history in its original setting, and the heritage livestock breeds add to that impact. The pigs, chickens, and goats of centuries ago can still teach us about agriculture today. At Henricus Park in Chesterfield County, this is Dave Miller. We're so proud you could join us to celebrate all the bounty that Virginia has to offer, from the kitchen, your lawn and garden, to our wide open spaces. We're proud to say that this is real Virginia. So from everyone at the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching and make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay.